When we talked about centripetal acceleration, we kept the actual speed of the object constant. So even though it was accelerating by changing direction, the magnitude of the velocity was not changing. This section is going to change all of that. Remember when circular motion is uniform, angular velocity is defined as the change in the angle of rotation, theta, over time. We also know that orbital, or linear velocity, is related to the angular velocity when the radius of the circular motion is taken into account. Here we are talking about angular acceleration, which is a circular motion that is not uniform. Just like in linear motion, there are different ways to accomplish this. We can speed up an object, slow it down, or change its direction. In the case of circular motion, the velocity is dependent upon the radius of the circle. What this means is that the velocity can change depending on where we are along the radius. Also, just like in linear motion, acceleration depends on the time it takes for the change in the velocity to occur. It is defined as the change in angular velocity over the change in time. It is measured in radians per second per second, or radians per second squared. Since the angular velocity is the same for all points, we can say also that the angular acceleration is the same for all points on the object. So angular velocity and angular acceleration are properties of the rotating object as a whole. Suppose you start a wheel turning from rest to an angular velocity of 250 RPM in 5.00 seconds. What is the angular acceleration? Well, what do we know? We are given time, which is 5 seconds. We also are given the angular velocity as 250 RPM. RPM is revolutions per minute, and that is not the correct calculation unit for angular velocity. At first glance, this might not look like much, but we know that in one revolution it's equal to 2 pi radians. Since radians is the unit we need for this calculation, we can convert our 250 RPM to radians per second using conversion factors. This gives us a value of 26.2 radians per second as our angular velocity. So now we know our angular velocity in radians per second, and we know our change in time. This is good because we can plug those into our angular acceleration equation, and we come up with 5.24 radians per second squared. So what if that wheel's brakes change the angular velocity at a rate of negative 87.3 radians per second squared? How long will it take to stop? Well, what would we need to know? We have our angular acceleration of negative 87.3 radians per second squared. And in the previous section, we were given the angular velocity of 26.2 radians per second. We can rearrange our formula for angular acceleration to solve for the change in time, and we find that it takes 0 0.300 seconds for the wheel to stop. If the angular velocity of a rotating object changes, every point in it has an angular acceleration. Just like we saw with velocity, each point also has a linear acceleration that acts in a direction that is tangent to that point's circular path. Let's say we take a wheel and roll it along the ground. How is the linear motion of the wheel related to the circular motion of the wheel? Remember that in circular motion, there is a linear velocity component that is at a tangent to whatever point on the circle we are talking about. That object really wants to stay in motion in the direction of that velocity, but the centripetal force keeps pulling it towards the center. Because there is a velocity in that tangent direction, that must mean that there is a linear acceleration in that direction as well. So we have two different accelerations to deal with. The centripetal acceleration affects the direction of the motion, but it does not affect the magnitude of the velocity. The acceleration along the tangent, or the tangential acceleration, has no effect on the direction of the object, but will affect the magnitude of the velocity. Because the tangential acceleration is working along the tangent, by definition, the tangential acceleration and the centripetal acceleration will work at right angles to each other. So just as a review, centripetal acceleration acts towards the center of the circle. It is what keeps the object in a circular motion. For example, if you have a ball on a string, the string is the force that is causing the centripetal acceleration. This is going to affect the direction of the motion. Tangential acceleration acts at a right angle to the centripetal acceleration. It affects the speed of the object. We designate a tangential acceleration as alpha sub t. Notice that centripetal acceleration is simply alpha. Even though the two accelerations are working differently, they are related. Since the tangential acceleration affects the magnitude of the velocity, it is proportional to the magnitude of the velocity. That's how we find it. 
Now we also know that the linear velocity, or the orbital velocity, of circular motion is the radius times the angular velocity. So we can say that the change in the radius and the angular velocity over time is equal to the tangential acceleration. At this point, let's assume our point is staying in the same place on our object. So the radius is not changing. We can pull that out, and what we have left is the change in angular velocity over the change in time. And we know what that is, right? It's the angular acceleration. So the angular acceleration for any point on a rotating object is related to the tangential acceleration by way of the radius. So now we have two accelerations that are working together on our point. Acceleration is acceleration no matter how you define it, so we can actually find the total linear acceleration by finding the vector sum of the two accelerations. So what if we accelerate a motorcycle from 0 to 30 meters per second in 4.20 seconds? What is the angular acceleration if the radius of the wheel is 0 0.320 meters? Well, we know that angular acceleration is equal to the tangential acceleration divided by the radius. We know the radius, so we can find the tangential acceleration, we can figure out the angular acceleration. We're in luck because tangential acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time, both of which we can determine from our problem. We have an initial velocity of 0 and a final velocity of 30, which gives us a change in velocity of 30 meters per second. This divided by the time results in a linear acceleration of 7.14 meters per second squared. The angular acceleration is found by dividing that linear acceleration by the radius, which is 22.3 radians per second squared. Now one more thing. When we talked about uniform circular motion, we found that a particle moving in a circle with a radius r and a linear speed of v had a centripetal acceleration. Of course, we can rewrite this in terms of angular velocity. This just gives us another expression for that centripetal acceleration. Okay, freaking out yet? It's a lot. There's a lot of new terms, probably. The good thing is that all of the stuff we already have covered, just with a little bit different terminology. We can relate these angular quantities that describe the rotation of an object to the linear quantities for each point of a rotating object. Displacement in linear terms is represented by x, or y if we're moving vertically, and it is measured in meters. For rotational motion, it is represented by theta, which is measured in radians. We can relate the linear displacement and the angular displacement by taking the radius times the angular displacement. Linear velocity is v in meters per second, while angular velocity omega is related by the product of the radius and the orbital velocity. An acceleration, meters per second squared, relates to the tangential acceleration by, you guessed it, the radius.